Hey, I'm Mandy from Deep Lizard. In this episode, we'll go through the process of fine tuning MobileNet for a custom data set. All right, so we are jumping right back into our Jupyter Notebook from last time. So make sure your code is in place from then since we will be building directly on that now. So first thing we're going to do is we are going to import MobileNet just as we did in the first MobileNet episode by calling tf.caris.applications.mobilenet.mobilenet. Remember, if this is your first time running this line, then you will need an internet connection to download it from the internet. Now let's just take a look at the model that we downloaded. So by calling model.summary, we have this output here that is showing us all of these lovely layers included in MobileNet. So this is just to get a general idea of the model because we will be fine tuning it. So the fine tuning process now is going to start out with us getting all of the layers up to the sixth to last layer. So if we scroll up and look at our output, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we are going to get all of the layers up to this layer and everything else is not going to be included. So all of these layers are what we are going to keep and transfer into a new model, our new fine tune model, and we are not going to include these last five layers. And this is just a choice that I came to after doing a little experimenting and testing. Um, the number of layers that you choose to include versus not include whenever you're fine tuning a model is going to come through experimentation and uh, personal choice. So for, for us, we are getting everything from this layer and above, and we are going to keep that in our new fine tune model. So let's scroll down. So we're doing that by calling mobile.layers passing in that sixth to last layer and output. Then we are going to create a variable called output and we're going to set this equal to a dense layer with 10 units. So this is going to be our output layer. That's why it's called output and 10 units due to our, the nature of our classes ranging zero through nine. And this as per usual is going to be followed by a softmax activation function to give us a probability di distribution among those 10 outputs. Now, this looks a little strange. So we're calling this and then we're like putting this uh, X variable next to it. So what's this about? Well, the MobileNet model is actually a functional model. So this is from the uh, functional API from Keras, not the sequential API. So we kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, whenever we fine-tuned VGG16, we saw that VGG16 was also indeed a functional model, but when we fine-tuned it, we iterated over each of the layers and added them to a sequential model at that point because we uh, weren't ready to introduce the functional model yet. So here, we are going to continue working with a functional model type, so that's why we are basically taking all of the layers here up to the sixth to last, and whenever we create this output layer and then call this um, the previous layers stored in X, here, that is the way that the functional model works. We're basically um, saying to this output layer, pass uh, all of the um, previous layers that we have stored in X up to the sixth to last layer in MobileNet. And then we can create the model using these two pieces, X and output, by saying, uh, by calling model, which is indeed a functional model when specified this way, and uh, specifying inputs equals mobile.input. So this is taking the input from the original MobileNet model, and outputs equals output. So at this point, output is all of the MobileNet model up until the sixth to last layer, plus this dense output layer. All right, so let's run these two cells to create our new model. All right, so our new model's now been created. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through and freeze some layers. So through some experimentation of my own, I have found that if we freeze all except for the last 23 layers, this appears to yield some decent results. So 
23 is not a magic number here. Uh, play with this yourself and let me know if you get better results. But basically what we're doing here is we're going through all the layers in the model and by default they are all trainable. So we're saying that we want only the last 23 layers to be trainable. All the layers except for the last 23 uh, make those not trainable. And um, just so that you understand, uh, relatively speaking, there are 88 total layers in the original mobile net model. And so we're saying that we don't want to train or that we only want to train the last 23 layers in our new model that we built just above. Recall this is much more than we earlier trained with our fine-tuned VGG16 model where we only trained the output layer. So let's go ahead and run that now. And now let's look at a summary of our new fine-tuned model. So here, if we just glance, it looks basically the same as what we saw from our original summary, but we will see here that now our, now our model ends with this global average pooling 2D layer, which recall before was the sixth to last layer where I said that we would include that layer and everything above it. So all the layers below the global average pooling layer that we previously saw in the original mobile net summary are now gone. And instead of an output layer with 1000 classes, we now have an output layer with 10 classes from the, uh, or corresponding to the 10 potential output classes that we have for our new sign language digits data set. If we compare the uh, total parameters and uh, how they're split amongst trainable and non-trainable parameters in this model with the original mobile, mobile debt model, then we will see a difference there as well. All right, so now this model has been built. We are ready to train the model. So the code here is nothing new. We are compiling the model in the same exact fashion using the Atom Optimizer 0.0001 learning rate, categorical, categorical cross entropy loss, and uh, accuracy as our metric. So this we have probably seen 2 million times up to this point in this course. So that's exactly the same. Additionally, uh, we have exactly the same fit function that we are running to train the model. So we're passing in our train batches as our data set. We are passing in validation batches as our validation data. And we are running this for 10 epochs um, actually, we're going to go ahead and run this for 30. I had uh, 10 here just to save time earlier from testing, but we're going to run this for 30 epochs, and we are going to set verbose equal to 2 to get the most verbose output. Now, let's see what happens. All right, so our model just finished training over 30 epochs, so let's check out the results. And if you see this output and you're wondering why the first output took 90 seconds and then we got or the first epoch took 90 seconds and then we got it down to five seconds just a few later. It's because I realized that I was running on battery and not on um, my laptop being plugged in. So once we plugged the laptop in, it beefed up and uh, started running much quicker. So let's scroll down and look basically at just like how we ended here. So we are at 100% accuracy on our training set and 92% accuracy on our validation set. So that is pretty freaking great considering the fact that this is a completely new data set, not having images that were included in the original ImageNet model. So these are pretty good results. A little bit overfitting here since our validation accuracy is lower than our uh, training accuracy. So if we wanted to fix that, then we could take some necessary steps to combat that overfitting issue. But if we look earlier at the earlier uh, epochs to see what kind of story is being told here, on our first epoch, our training accuracy actually starts out at 74% among 10 classes. So that is not bad for a starting point. Uh, and we quickly get to 100% on our training accuracy just within four epochs. So that's great. But you can see that at that point, we're only at 81% accuracy for our validation set. So we have a decent amount of overfitting going on uh, earlier on here. And then as we progress through the training process, the overfitting is becoming less and less of a problem. And you can see that we actually, at this point, if we just look at the last 
eight epochs that have run here. We've not even stalled out yet on our validation loss. Um, it's not stalled out in terms of decreasing, and our, val our validation accuracy has not stalled out in terms of increasing. So perhaps just running more epochs on this data will um, eradicate the overfitting problem. Um, otherwise, you can do some tuning yourself, changing some hyperparameters around, um, do a, a different structure of fine tuning on the model. So uh, freeze more or less than the uh, last 23 layers for uh, during the fine tuning process, or just experiment yourself. And if you come up with something that yields better results than this, then put it in the comments and let us know. So we have one last thing we want to do with our fine-tuned mobile net model, and that is use it on our test set. So we are familiar, you know the drill with this procedure. At this point, we have done it several times. So we are now going to uh, get predictions from the model uh, on our test set, and then we are going to plot those predictions to a confusion matrix. So we are first going to get our true labels by calling testbatches.classes. We're then going to gain predictions from the model by calling model.predict and passing in our test set stored in test batches here, setting verbose equal to zero because we do not want to see any output from the predictions. And now we are creating our confusion matrix uh, using scikit-learn's confusion matrix that we imported earlier. We are setting our true labels equal to the test labels that we define just here above. We are setting our predicted labels to the argmax of our predictions across axis one. And now we are going to check out our class indices of the test batches just to make sure they are what we think they are. And they are, of course, uh, classes labeled zero through nine. So we define our labels for our confusion matrix here accordingly. And then we call our plot confusion matrix that we brought in earlier in the notebook and that we have used 17,000 times up to this point in this course. And we are passing in our confusion matrix for what to plot. We are passing in our labels that we want to correspond to our confusion matrix and giving our confusion matrix the very general title of confusion matrix because, hey, that's what it is. So let's plot this. Oh no, so plot confusion matrix is not defined. Well, it definitely is just somewhere in this notebook. I must have skipped over it. Here we go. Nope, here we are. All right, so here's where plot confusion matrix is defined. Let's bring that in. Now it is defined and run back here. So looking from the top left to the bottom right diagonal, we see that the model appears to have done pretty well. So we have 10 classes total with five samples per class. And we see that we have mostly, we have all fours and fives across this diagonal, meaning that most of the time the model predicted correctly. So for example, for a nine, um, five times out of five, the model predicted an image was a nine when it actually was. For an eight, however, only four out of five times did the model correctly predict. Looks like one of the times the model let's see, predicted a one when it should have been an eight. But in total, we've got one, two, three, four, five incorrect predictions out of 50 total. So that gives us a 90% accuracy rate on our test set, which is not surprising for us given the accuracy that we saw right above on our validation set. So hopefully this series on MobileNet has given you further insight to how we can fine tune models for custom data set and use transfer learning to use the information that a model gained from its original training set on a completely new task in the future. By the way, we are currently in Vietnam filming this episode. If you didn't know, we also have a vlog channel where we document our travels and share a little bit more about ourselves. So check that out at the Blizzard Vlog on YouTube. Also, be sure to check out the corresponding blog for this episode, along with other resources available on deepblizzard.com. And check out the Deep Blizzard Hive Mind, where you can gain exclusive access to perks and rewards. Thanks for contributing to Collective Intelligence. I'll see you next time.